Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this penultimate event in our Art in Action webinar series in which we have been exploring a wide range of issues emerging from the intersections of literature, politics and celebrity culture across historical periods and of course different literary and cultural contexts. My name is Sandra Meyer and together with Ruth Scobie, I'm one of the conveners of this series, which has really been our attempt to recreate or possibly to resurrect our two day conference on the theme, which we had originally planned for March this year at the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. Now, as we're getting close to the end of our series of summer webinars, We've got a string of stellar events to look back on, many of which have been recorded and are available for you to access online through our Torch website and the Torch YouTube channel. Uh, I should also say that we've been lucky enough to complement our online events with a substantial portfolio of additional content, all very generously and very kindly provided by our contributors and also to be found on our Torch website, such as, and I'm just going to pick out one example here, a recent example, uh, a very powerful and fascinating email exchange between Peter MacDonald and the acclaimed South African poet, translator, scholar and activist Anki in which they probe, and I think also quite provocatively so, a series of issues that have been lying at the heart of our conversations here, such as this notion of the publicness of the writer as opposed to their celebrity status, translation as a distinct and also a very powerful form of activism, and of course the political potential of the creative act itself. So needless to say, we are hugely grateful to Anki and Peter for recreating what would have been an extraordinary keynote event in our Art and Action conference back in March, and also of course for making it so widely available to our international audiences. Now in this piece, Anki also briefly touches upon how the collective action of groups and organizations shaped her work as a writer and as an activist. And this is of course something that takes us straight to the theme of today's event, an event that brings together a distinguished panel to discuss the activist interventions of Penn, the first worldwide non-governmental writers organization whose work is centrally based on this very complex interplay and perhaps even the inseparability of literature and politics. For nearly a century now, and of course next year is a big year, an important year for the organization as it marks the centenary of the foundation of Penn in 1921, Penn has been one of the most influential international players in the advocacy of human rights, the protection of freedom of expression, as well as linguistic and cultural diversity. But also I think in this process of shaping this public notion of the writer as a politically engaged individual who has a very clear social responsibility. Now in many ways our speakers today will sketch out for us in a nutshell the organization's fascinating and varied history and the idea is that in their opening statements they will be kind of zooming in on the defining moments in the organization also reflecting the most incisive historical and political developments of the 20th and also the 21st centuries. We will then launch into a more informal conversation, which will also give our panelists a chance to respond to each other's statements. And then as ever, we will close our webinar by taking questions from the audience. So you're all very warmly encouraged and invited to participate in the conversation and to post your questions through the Zoom Q&A feature, which I'll then read out and pass on to the panel. But now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our truly stellar lineup of panelists today, including on the one hand, a set of renowned scholars who've studied the history of Penn, particularly in relation to its defense of free expression, and crucially to writers and activists who've been working with and for Penn for many years and who've held key positions in an organization whose work remains as essential as ever in these troubled times. Now I'm going to introduce our five panelists in the order in which they will be speaking and apologies for trying to keep super brief. Uh, uh, we could already take up half of this session reading out the impressive biographies of our panelists. So to begin with, it's great to have Peter MacDonald here with us today. Peter is Professor of English and Related Literature at the University of Oxford and uh, also a Fellow of St. Hugh's College. 
And his work focuses on a wide range of issues, sort of centering very broadly on this interface of literature, the modern state, freedom of expression, the history of writing systems, cultural institutions and publishing, as well as multilingualism, translation and interculturality, topics that he covers, for instance, in his books, The Literature Police and Artifacts of Writing, and which also quite auspiciously intersect with the themes that we've been raising here in this webinar series. Then, joining us from Boston today, uh, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome Leticia Sacchini, who is a research fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris and also a visiting scholar at Boston University. She's the author of a monograph on the Indian poet Arun Kolakar, whose work she's also translated into French. And she is currently researching the history of the Penn All India Center, which I think will also form part of a book around issues of cultural and literary freedom and the poetics and politics of modernism in Cold War India. Now, I'd like to say that uh, both Leticia and Peter are actually part of a fascinating research project which is in fact directed by our next panelist. It's a great pleasure to welcome Rachel Potter, who is Professor of Modern Literature at the University of East Anglia. And as I said, lead researcher on the AHRC funded Writers and Free Expression Project, which explores the history of writers activism since 1921, with a specific focus on pen and its activities in different geopolitical areas. Um, Rachel's research on the early history of the organization will result in a book on literary activism and I would also like to mention that she's currently co-editing the Cambridge Companion to 20th Century Literature and Politics, which is of course also very pertinent to our discussions here. Then it's a huge pleasure to have Carlos Torner here with us today, a leading Catalan writer, academic, human rights activist who is currently the executive director of Penn International and who has been involved in the organization's work in various roles for over 20 years. And these roles include, for instance, that as chair of Penn's Translation and Linguistic Rights Committee, and he's also participated in several missions in support of imprisoned writers, which is, of course, something that we're hearing more, we'll be hearing more about shortly, and uh, which is, of course, an absolutely fascinating story that we're going to hear. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Margie Orford to the panel. Margie is an internationally acclaimed novelist, journalist, activist, and scholar. Like Carla, she's been centrally involved in Penn's activities for many years in many different roles. She was president of Penn South Africa from 2014 to 2017, and also a board member of Penn International. She's also quite excitingly a co-author of the Penn International Women's Manifesto, which she will be talking about in more detail. So let me just say that Art in Action is truly thrilled to be hosting this wonderful event. So an enormous thanks to all of you for taking the time and for joining us here today. And without any further ado, let me pass on to our wonderful speakers and starting off with Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Sandra. Uh, it's really, really good to be here. So for this introductory segment, what I'd like to do is uh, focus briefly on two uh, big uh, key, key documents. Uh, the first one, and Jenny, if you can pull up slide one at this point, that'd be good. Uh, the first one is a letter John Galsworthy, the British novelist and founding president of Penn, uh, sent to the London Times on the 24th of April, 1923. So as Sandra mentioned, Penn was founded in October 1921, two years earlier. And this letter um, is the first really uh, major public articulation of Penn's uh, stated aims and objectives. So that's the first uh, document I want to look at. And the second one, if uh, Jenny, if you could bring up slide two. The second one is a photograph of the dinner um, held for the inaugural Penn Congress in London on the 1st of, no, of, of May, 1923. So in effect, as you can see by the timing, the letter is essentially an advertisement for the upcoming Congress, which, came, uh, which happened a week later. So Galsworthy is anticipating that event and using the Times as a platform to articulate Penn's views. Um, Jenny, if we can go to slide three, which takes us back to the, the letter. 
So what I'd like to do at this point is just f read out, really, so you have it as part of the discussion, uh, the highlighted bits in this letter. Uh, uh, the first is, and I'll read out the whole of paragraph two. Uh, this is what Goldsworthy has to say. Its aim, that's the aim of Penn, is simply, says Goldsworthy, the fostering of good feeling, hospitality, and understanding among the writers of the world, poets, playwrights, editors, essayists, novelists, whence the name Penn. It meddled not with politics. The meeting ground is that of letters. And then, as you can see, there's a certain anxiety around this point. He comes back to this key issue of politics at the end and says, and these are the final two sentences, people who see politics behind everything must for once be disappointed. When we say we are not political, we mean it. So I think from this distance, it's not difficult to look back at these words in particular with some skepticism or even scorn. We could easily, for instance, dismiss this as simple-minded 1920s aestheticism or perhaps as Euro-American bourgeois idealism in its worst form. So it's not just that Penn is going to be apolitical, but often it's going to be anti-political. And perhaps if we read this letter in conjunction with that rather um, well-turned-out, well-groomed uh, dinner, um, then this kind of reading uh, looks more and more likely. But what I'd like to do, and this is simply the, the final point I want to make, uh, what I'd like to do is suggest two reasons why we shouldn't look back at this statement uh, in a spirit of scornful disdain. The first is that Goldsworthy's view, um, though widely shared by the, especially by the English and Americans uh, with members of Penn, was in fact, and you, as you could predict, contested at the time, perhaps most notably by the German left avant-garde and especially with, by figures like Bertolt Brecht and Ernst Toller. So that's the first reason. The second reason for not looking back disdainfully at these, this formulation, um, and I think this is the more important reason, is that seen in the long history of Penn's internal debates, this articulation of the letters politics divide marks the beginning of Penn's sustained effort to create a supra-political space. So supra-political as opposed to apolitical, anti-political space for critique and action, which would form, would or at least from the 1930s, it would start to to ensure that put, putting Penn at the vanguard of a new emancipatory articulation of human rights. So the main thing, I think, if we think about this genealogically over a century, is what we see here is the groundwork for a new kind of discourse emerging. And I think this is where we can trace it and what Penn's history becomes incredibly interesting and important is to trace that development from this letter right the way on to the present, which is, I hope, what we will do today. And now I'll hand over to Leticia. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm also very thrilled uh, to be part of this conversation. So thank you all and thank you, Sandra, for organizing it. So I'll discuss, discuss the writer's activism uh, of Penn from a colonial or post-colonial perspective with the example of Penn uh, in India, founded in 1933 in Bombay with Tagore as its first president. So the Indian Center, like other branches of international pen, was both shaped by internationalist ideals and cleared a space for specific Indian struggles. So the first issue of its journal opened with a question, why a pen club in India? And the, the answer is defiant, why not? Are Indian writers not good enough to take their place in the fellowship of the world's creative minds? So this sets the tone for the Indian Pen's activism. One of its aims was to redress the asymmetric exchange of nations and literatures on the world stage, and especially redress India's invisibility. A few months earlier, um, at Penn's International Congress in Barcelona, Sofia Wadia, who was the founder of the Indian Pen, insisted that the East must not be excluded if the Pen is to be truly international, and that India 
uh, must stop being seen as a beautiful museum of antiquities, but as a living and vigorous nation. So, of course, exalting the value of India through the value of Indian literature was meant to serve the cause of political independence and freedom from colonial servitude was foremost on the Indian pen's agenda. So let me show you um, um, an issue of the Indian pen in 1940 with the title, The Pen Stands for Free Speech, which is interesting um, on, on different grounds. First, because there's this repeated assertion, which comes back to what Peter was showing and saying. It's actually the first sentence that pen is not concerned with political issues. So the case that is made here in support of free speech is presented not as a question of, ta of taking sides in a political battle or East versus West, but as a matter of principle, insofar as precisely it is above state or party politics. Second, it's interesting because it shows that India's freedom is seen as tied to the world's freedom, that you can't dissociate one from the other. Um, third, that the enemies of freedom, or uh, what Mulkaraj Anand, who's an Indian writer who was also an important member of the pen, um, um, uh, called the ugly face of fascism, um, which, as we all know, is very much a reality for Indian writers today. So that ugly face of fascism takes different guises. So to register its protest against the sentencing by the British to four years of imprisonment of Nehru, um, who was to become the vice president of the Indian pen, this text starts by a reminder of Penn's many international resolutions in support of free speech. But it's also to point to the hypocrisy or the duplicity of an organization that stays mute to the encroachments of liberty in non-Western parts of the world. The other reminder in that text is that India itself is engaged in the war against Hitlerism, which is also waged, and that's the first um, uh, quote, quotation highlighted on the left in yellow, um, so which is also waged in the name of Hitlerism's total annihilation of free speech. If the text continues, it is legitimate to fight Hitlerism through special wartime legislation, to use it against enemy, enemies of Hitlerism who are fighting their own battles of liberty uh, is injurious. And the last line on the, um, uh, sorry, on the last line on the left, the left paragraph, and who can blame those who point to such unfair action as being a species of Hitlerism. So fascist and colonial repression are here synonymous and command the same resistance. At least the fight for liberty appears as worthy and as imperative in India as, as in Europe. Um, again, in the text, the Indian pen is careful to show that its protest is not motivated by specific political or nationalist considerations. India is not fighting for itself alone. If the pen truly stands for free speech, and remember that earlier passage, if the pen is to be truly international. So if the pen truly stands for free speech, then the duty of its members is to fight on behalf of the principle of freedom wherever it's attacked. And this also connects to Penn's ideal of an interdependent world community of writers. Look at the uh, passage highlighted on the right. Um, the weakening of liberty in one place weakens it in every corner of the world. Just a very final brief point um, on the question of activism. I was thinking of Amit Chaudhuri's definition of literary activism as the opposite of market activism, um, which he argues has hijacked or standardized the idea and value of literature, telling us, for instance, what a good novel must be, is or must be. And he mostly focuses on literary activism as activism on behalf of literature, rather than the more, the more politically straightforward um, activism through literature. Perhaps, um, and that's, what's, that's what Penn shows, it actually is both at the same time, activism on behalf of and through literature, clearing a space for multiple different marginal critical voices and stories 
making sure they continue to be seen or heard, that it's not always the same ones that are recognized. So in the case of the Indian pen, um, making room for India, for Indian literatures and Indian freedom struggles on the world stage, making sure everyone has a right to a voice, even if these voices are considered insignificant. And I'm just quoting from the last passage um, in yellow. Um, numerically, we're small, we're insignificant. Financially, we're poor, and therefore we are insignificant from the worldly point of view. We are therefore unknown and unrecognized, and Sophia Wadia ends, but friends, we do not feel small or weak. Um, and I'll pass on now to Rachel. In my talk, I'm going to focus on a fraught moment in Penn's history. I see the moment of Penn's greatest internal conflicts as exposing most dramatically what's at stake in art's actions. At the first Penn Congress after the ending of the Second World War in Stockholm in 1946, writers debated what kinds of actions Penn should take to deal with Nazi and fascist collaborators who wanted to return to the organisation and whether there should be limits on fascist speech. Members were deeply divided on the issue. Although the problem of fascist Penn members and their speech had troubled Penn throughout the 1930s, Penn had tended to defend the individual writer's right to free speech. However, in this post-war moment, the implications of free speech were subjected to a new kind of fierce scrutiny. The Dutch resolution, which is the first image that I'm going to show you, called for centres to create a list of writer collaborators to be circulated to other centres so that, as we see here, they do not occupy any function in the public, literary or journalistic life of their country or take up pen membership elsewhere. Some, including International Pen Secretary Herman Ould, insisted that the creation of a list was similar to the secretive and censorious activities of the Gestapo. He opposed the motion as not only illegal, but also as dangerous and contrary to the spirit of the pen, as he put it. It would involve, he says, members arrogating to themselves the role of inquisitors. Another delegate argued that Penn was not a legal body, that writers should not set themselves up as judges, and that literature was beyond the moral categories of right and wrong. They should think as artists, as he put it, not propagandists or politicians. More numerous, however, were the members putting the opposite view. Many spoke of the impossibility of including Nazi collaborators within Penn. They might join in order to spread fascist propaganda, some said. Belgian writer Pierrard argued that as writers, we must take a position for the principle which is the basis of our association, suggesting the extent to which the debate was not simply about the creation of lists. It was also about the identity or values of Penn as it moved into a future in which the status of democracy, the Cold War, the continued existence of Franco Spain and Penn's consultative status to the UN all in sight. In a debate about whether there should be limits on fascist speech, delegates questioned whether free expression was a key egalitarian value tied to dem democratic politics and fundamentally opposed to Nazism or whether it was an individual right irrespective of content, what we would call in contemporary legal language content neutrality, or in a very different sense what the Penn organisation had long insisted was art's disconnection from politics. Some members argued that fascists use free speech arguments selectively because they think, as one delegate put it, put it that liberty can be abused. As another delegate said, the Penn Club Charter calls for total liberty, but the idea of giving liberty to those who want to destroy liberty is a kind of suicide. Others worried about tolerating the free expression of beliefs, the evil consequences of which you have bitterly experienced yourself. The Dutch Centre identified these evil consequences as the Nazi principles that, as they put it, had found acceptance because of propaganda.
The propaganda problem was amplified by new technologies, most prominently the radio, allowing for the mass and transnational dissemination of speech. The US resolution, which is the second image I want to show you today, as we can see, it's specifically called for voluntary restraint in relation to the evils of a free press of what they called mendacious publication, deliberate falsehood and distortion of facts for political and personal ends. Now, Penn had long argued that writers wielded powerful forms of cultural capital and that they should use this power to defend writers' rights against imprisonment and exile. But here, writers' ability to influence others by allowing ideas to find communal acceptance and spread inhumane language that degrades the dignity of persons was precisely the problem. A reason for the organisation to be vigilant in policing its membership rules. When it came to the vote on the Dutch resolution, which is the third image I'm going to show you today, we can see that writers lined up largely on national lines and depending on whether their country had been occupied. As you can see here, the result was 17 in favour of the Dutch resolution, 7 against and 3 abstentions. It is not hard to fathom why the issue of Nazi collaborators and the impact of their speech was so fraught in 1946. There were similar debates at draft stage of what became Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. But looking back at this moment in Penn's history, I am struck by the similarities between these debates and contemporary debates about hate speech and what is now called fake news. There are similar urgent questions about, amongst contemporary free speech advocates and pen centres about the consequences of speech and whether egalitarian principles are furthered or curtailed by placing limits on some kinds of speech. What strikes me is that the left liberal desire to shore up strong anti-fascist liberties in 1946 emerged because of an urgent sense of a crisis in democracy both in the recently lived past and uncertain future. And I'm very glad to pass on to Carlos Tortona, who's going to talk about um, Penn further. Thank you. Hello, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues and very especially Art and Action and Sandra and Ruth for the invitation to speak today. And if we can see the first slide, you will see that this is simply a group of writers and publishers in a field of snow. Because this is the kind of picture where it's more important what you don't see in the picture than what you see in the picture. In the center, there is Jennifer Clement, president of Penn International. In the picture, there are two other past presidents of Penn, Per Vatsberg, who is also the chair of the Literature Nobel Committee and John Rostom Soul. I am behind Jennifer Clement with the hat, uh, Eugene Shulgin, international vice president, Eva Boniers and Ronald Blondin, important publishers from Sweden and from France, and members of the board and delegates from different pen centers, and Burhan Somnes representing Turkey, uh, a Turkish lawyer and member of the board of Penn International who has been organizing this mission where in January 2017, in front of Silivri prison in very close to Istanbul, one hour drive from Istanbul. In this prison, there is more than 17,000 prisoners at present. And what you don't see is that in front of the writers and publishers, there is a military truck, there is a bus with anti-riot police and the cameras of Norwegian TV because as soon as we tried to have the prison on our back and read our statement in front of Norwegian TV, immediately the military truck and the anti-riot bus appeared and they forced us to take the pictures and to read our statement just with this field of snow behind us. This was a moment of very acute repression of freedom of expression in Turkey and publishers and writers had been asking Penn International to organize this mission. Maybe it's the largest mission ever uh, of Penn uh, to support uh, freedom of expression in, in a country. 
we were very proud to know that when we were taking this picture and when we were reading our statement inside Silibri Prison, the word was, uh, had been uh, running and everyone knew that we were there uh, defending, uh, defending the, the writers and journalists. Uh, at the time, 150 of them were in Silibri Prison. So Penn has been running these missions uh, in many countries, in Peru, in Mexico, in Cuba, in Yemen, in Russia, in South Korea, uh, since the Writers and Prison Committee of Penn was created in 1960 to articulate Penn's defense of uh, our colleagues who are imprisoned or persecuted. And then now let's see another uh, aspect of the activism of Penn. If you can see the second slide, I have chosen this slide. You can see in International Translation Day in London, Ngugi Wationgo uh, presenting a, a translation in dialogue with Amanda Hopkinson, who at the time was the chair of English Pen Translation Committee. And the two in the picture are very relevant. Ngugi Wationgo uh, represents the effort of Pen of supporting all literatures in equality, all languages. Ngugi, who, when he was in prison in 1978, uh, there was an important campaign of, of Penn uh, in, uh, for his liberation. But there in prison, Ngugi decided that from that moment onwards, he would be writing all his uh, uh, novels in Jikuyu language. And he has become the symbol of African writers writing in the African national uh, languages. In 1928, in a Congress in Oslo, Penn decided that pen centers would be based on literary and cultural ground. And this has been the driving force to create the network of what, close to 150 pen centers today in the whole world, including Tibetan pen, Uyghur pen, Kurdish pen, uh, Catalan and, and Basque pen, and just recently, the newly created Chiapas multicultural pen center, uh, gathering writers in nine Maya languages and in Zoke language. So you have Ngugi representing this diversity, this equality of literatures from the perspective of Penn, but on the other side, you have Amanda Hopkinson representing the effort of uh, English translators, English writers and the English writing community to increase the number of publications because English Penn, Penn America, the Australian Penn Centers, they all know that the English language is one of the languages that translates the least in comparison with other literatures. And there, ha there has been this very powerful, uh, ambitious projects, the Pen Translates Awards in, in English Pen, the World Voices Festival, and the, and the, and the Translation Awards of Pen America, who are really have been promoting this exchange of literatures and this effort of the Pen International Community so that all writers from all literatures are considered equal and are welcomed in our uh, international community. And now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Margie Orford. Um, hello and thank you. Um, thank you, Carlos. Thank you all of you for those wonderful presentations about the history of PIN. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, the Women's Manifesto, which um, in all the writing I've done, I think this is a piece of work that I'm most proud of. Uh, if we could have the first slide. Um, the Penn in International Women's Manifesto, I'm just gonna read that last little paragraph. All of you can read the whole thing as I'm speaking if you wish, but. I think the very last line um, sums up for me what Penn is about, an activist organization which defends writers and um, saves them, if we can, and their words. So Penn believes that the act of silencing a person is to deny their existence. It is a kind of death. Humanity is both wanting and bereft without the full and free expression of women's creativity and knowledge. Now, the Women's Manifesto was being collectively drafted as Trump swept into power in the United States in 2016. The manifesto was initiated by Jennifer Clement, the first woman, first people, to head Penn International in nearly a century of existence. 
At that Women's March in Washington, the Women's March um, to protest the inauguration of Trump, an elderly woman held up a sign saying, I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit. And I had the same feeling then and I have it now. Why am I protesting it? Given the current politics of Putin, Erdogan, Johnson, a resurgent Taliban, the list is actually too long to name them all. The answer I think is obvious. These are men who centralize power around themselves. And that power is premised on the most lethal binaries of race, of religion, and above all, of gender. This resurgence of patriarchal power goes hand in hand with the curtailment of women's freedoms. Something most apparent, I think, to us here on the internet. The attacks on the free speech of women, often with a weaponizing of a libertarian and highly masculinized concept of free speech of the, of the far right and the alt right, attempts to restrict and to assign us women to the domestic sphere with all the bodily policing, coercion, and violence that goes with that. The Greeks called this female gendered domestic and reproductive sphere the oikos. It was the binary opposite to the male gendered sphere of the doxa, which is the public realm, the realm of free speech, of politics, decision, and of authority. That architecture of gender, power, and speech endures, and it is this that the Women's Manifesto addresses. The particular remit of Penn International and the global network of centers that make up its membership is, of course, literature. So let us turn to literature to see how this works, to Homer's um, The Odyssey. And let's consider Mary Beard's focus on one particular scene when Penelope comes down from her quarters to the public part of her own home to address her adolescent son and the returning warriors. Telemachus, her son, is both threatened and threatening. He reprimands his mother and tells her that because she is a woman, she has no right to speak, that she has no right to what he calls muthos, the ancient Greek word that meant public speech. He orders her to return to her quarters, to the woman's quarters, and she obeys. Why? Put yourself in Penelope's place. She's in a room filled with armed men. In front of her is a son whose very authority, whose honor depends on his ability to silence a woman, to expel her from the public sphere, to defend with violence if necessary, the doxa as a domain for men only. It is a dangerous moment and Penelope falls silent, censured and censored, a woman speaking in public out of turn. It is the silence of half of history, of half of humanity. Our notions of free speech and human rights that shape our current discussions, these pen ones and generally in the world, come out of the enlightenment and the tumult of the French Revolution. In August 1789, the French National Constituent Assembly passed the founding document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Free speech was fundamental to this declaration. However, Man and citizen meant men. These were men's rights, not women's. And this was contested immediately by the abolitionist philosopher and writer, Olympe de Gouges. In 1791, she published the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. And I quote her, woman has the right to mount the scaffold, she wrote. She must equally have the right to mount the rostrum. For de Gourge, and I quote again, the most important expression of liberty was the right to free speech. However, the enlightenment presumption of the natural rights of the citizen was in direct contradiction to the equally firmly held belief in the natural sexual difference, both of which were so-called founding principles of nature. Two years later, de Gourge did indeed mount the scaffold. She was one of three women to be executed during the reign of terror and the only woman to be executed for sedition. Accusations that stemmed for the main part for, on her insistence on women's rights, particularly the right to free speech. Susan B. Anthony, the American civil rights campaigner would write in 1900 that no advanced step taken by women has been so bitterly contested as that of speaking in public for nothing which they have attempted, not even to secure the suffrage have they been so abused, contemned, and antagonized? Now, to speak publicly is to speak with authority. 
to claim an authority that has been, and in many quarters still is, fiercely defended as a masculine domain. These asymmetries of power are reflected in and made through speech and writing, through language. The Penn Charter states that literature knows no frontiers. These frontiers were thought of as borders between countries and nations. The Women's Manifesto, however, makes clear that for many women in the world, for almost all women until relatively recently, the first and the last and perhaps the most powerful front door, frontier was the front door of the house she lived in. Until recently, that was either her father's or her husband's house. This is an internal border whose guards and injunctions need to be considered as a wall that is not always physical. These are intimate prisons that work to great effect. Women, in order to have free speech, the right to read, the right to write, need the right to roam both physically and intellectually. But there are few, if any, social systems that do not look with hostility at a woman who walks by herself. Just ask the internet if any of you are on Twitter. Now, if we could have slide two, please. Imagining how differently the course of both history and literature might have been is at the heart of the Women's Manifesto, as is our imagination of the future. The political activism required is evident in the activism enshrined in the political aims that follow that more poetic preamble that um, proceeded. These aims are, and these shape the activist work that Penn can do, that uh, Carlos's director makes sure is done in all the centers around the world, are nonviolence, safety, education, equality, access, and parity. There's no literature without that political framing. So we must reimagine, rethink, rewrite, and rethink the work of women's free speech. How to do this? I want to return you, if I may, once more to that scene of Homer's and that confrontation between Penelope and Telemachus. Let's imagine that when this boy ordered her back to her quarters, when he denied her the right to muthos, to public speech, that she refused to go. Let's imagine that she insisted on speaking and that when she spoke, she was not alone. Let's imagine that the wiser, more confident men intervened and instructed Telemachus thus, you, they said, be silent. Listen to the words of this woman. This space, this doxa is one that should be shared. She is wise and will have good counsel for she has experienced the pointless slaughter of the Trojan Wars too. Let us listen to her and see that there is another way. Can I have a third slide, please? History teaches us that freedom, equality, and respect are brought about through collective action and solidarity. A number of world leaders have endorsed this manifesto, the United Nations, for example, and as you can see in this last slide, Nicholas Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland. This was taken in 2018 at the Edinburgh Book Festival. There have been many others since then. The manifesto is widely translated and it has been adopted and used by pen centers all over the world to change things structurally and to defend the rights of women who have been incarcerated or threatened because of their free speech. This public work, this framing, I think is key to making sure that the aspirations of women's free speech that we have in the, in the manifesto are made something real. Uh, thank you, and I think now it's back to Sandra. Yes, hello back and uh, a, a huge thank you to, to all of you for what's been an absolutely fascinating tour de force, really capturing in a nutshell uh, the history of Penn and it's almost immediate politicization I think against the background of the great world political zesuras of uh, the 20th century um, and also your presentations which I think once more have given us a, a very good overview of the kind of self-proclaimed goals of the organization which are just to remind ourselves celebrating literature preserving linguistic diversity defending freedom of expression 
and protecting right is at, at risk. I think this has been sort of wonderfully, wonderfully covered. And um, just to get us going before we uh, take questions from the audience, um, I mean, one of the many things and one of the many issues that's really sort of stuck out for me and which I also think is why this particular forum is uh, a particularly apt one to host these conversations is this issue of visibility or invisibility, as Leticia said. Yeah? Um, which I think it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, from this very strong social element that is there in the origins of the club, and I, I really love that picture that you that you showed, Peter. Kind of made me think of an early version of a Booker Prize dinner. Yeah? Kind of authors congregating and connecting through social events. Yeah, to making things visible, making literatures visible, making uh, communities visible, um, making political issues visible through, for instance, the media attention yeah, that you get that is commanded by the big names in literature. And of course, this is now the obvious question, and uh, I think you can tell where this is going. The elephant in the room really is, is probably that of celebrity. And I think it's quite telling that none of you have actually mentioned that term. And I'm becoming quite self-conscious about actually sort of linking up celebrity with literature because it's so clear how uncomfortable many authors feel about being sort of branded a literary celebrity and being traded as a literary celebrity in the marketplace. And yet there's this really striking passage in this interview that I think, Peter, you did with Jennifer Clement in 2017, where she actually says, we are in the time of celebrity. And I think it would be difficult to argue with that in a, in a way. And of course, the argument is that celebrity capital is a form of capital that can be converted into various other types of capital. So it equals media visibility and it equals a sense of the world is watching. Yeah? So I guess my question then is, I mean, as we all know, celebrity is a, a double-edged sword and it may lend visibility, but it may of course also detract from certain political issues that are being advocated. And so the question then is, what do you think is the specific political potential of literary celebrity? And how does it affect both positively or negatively the work of Penn? And perhaps you could all try and come in here from your uh, different historical perspectives and how this notion of literary celebrity has developed over the decades. Is there anyone who would like to start? I mean, can I just speak and can you hear me? Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, the, you know, I think the, the word celebrity, we should perhaps be less worried about it. You know, writers, certain writers have always had moral authority and weight and their renown is perhaps a, a less anxiety inducing word, is of great value. And in the work I did um, as president of Penn in South Africa, where all literature, of course, and Peter will know this all too well, is highly politicized. So many writers were imprisoned or exiled or had their works banned and stuff. So there was not the, the anxiety so much about if it's political. I found in, in the work that I did um, as the president, there were a number of cases in which I could call on writers who had um, engagements with um, South Africa. J.M. Kutsia was always one, who would lend their... Um, authority and access to a wider global audience about a particular issue. Salman Rushdie is another writer who has done that. Uh, we had a writer, a Muslim woman, who um, had a sort of, you know, attempt, to, she was beaten up attempts on her. So for me, drawing on a person who has direct access to immediately, I mean, someone or J.M. Kutsia phones the New York Times and says, can I do um, an op-ed? The New York Times rolls over and does it. You know what I mean? So it's it's a very useful tool in the political strategy that you are using as an activist, as a, a right, a literary activist. So, and they are celebrities. I mean, it's it's just the new word for being a famous and powerful person. I mean, maybe the one thing I could just throw in a, a historical point and also make just one. Uh, ongoing long point about Penn and, and this issue. The historical point is that Penn mobilized- the very, 
mobilized renowned celebrity, th those sorts of things from the beginning. I mean, uh, it, it, its first John. letter letterhead had uh, um, about uh, all the Nobel Prize winners that it had put as honorary members, and it had, had those sorts of things on. So it was it was constantly using that and using writers' visibility to help its own initiatives. So that's one side of it. Um, the other side of it, however, is what makes what I'm also interested in is for Penn as a human rights organization um, over the time is it does an enormous amount as a matter of deliberate policy, I think, uh, Carlos can, uh, and uh, Margie can, can talk about this as well, uh, it does an enormous amount behind the scenes. So actually, there's a, there's a, within Penn, and what makes Penn interesting is there's a constant choice between do we go the mobilization of renown and writers and Nobel Prize winners and people standing in front of a prison route or do we go the quiet route of uh, so much work that Penn does behind the scenes? And I think that's also what people you know, this maybe are not aware of enough, that there's also there's a, there's a choice and it's often a strategic one. Mm -hmm. Carlos. Yes, that, that's to, to, to engage with what Peter was saying. That is absolutely true. In Penn, we always, in our advocacy, in our defense of writers who are in prison or at risk, we always make a priority uh, to defend the writer. And if we need to go silent, we go silent. Let me just explain with one example how celebrities, famous writers, are supporting Penn. We are in Kyrgyzstan. We have been, we are celebrating a Congress in Kyrgyzstan in 2014. And in that country, there is a, for a long time, there has been a writer in prison, as in Jonas Karov. And we have been trying our best, but no way of obtaining important meetings with key uh, uh, ministers. Or... And then we have Jan Martel, the author of Life of Pi, who comes to the Congress and we ask for a meeting with the president of the country. And we say that Jan Martel will be part of the delegation. And immediately, the president of uh, Kyrgyzstan received us. It was one of the most memorable uh, meetings. I have never had a uh, head of state shouting at the delegation in the way. He, he really was enraged when he saw that Jan Martel and the whole delegation, the president at the time, the first and so on, and the delegation from different uh, countries, we were insisting that he needed to liberate that, that writer. In fact, uh, as John Askarov died in prison just one month ago, and we have been mourning, I know that uh, in, in, in the, in, among the speakers, there is a leaks parody from, uh, from French Vermont uh, Swiss Penn Center, and uh, who have been campaigning uh, tirelessly for, uh, as in John Askarov. So we, we decided to use the silent way. We succeeded in reaching the head of state. And of course, we realized that it was a very difficult, quite desperate situation because the, the regime was uh, wanting re revenge on that, on, on, the, on Azim Jalaskarov. But we, we, we use all the time. So uh, Naomi Klein is invited to La Valletta in Malta to give a, a conference. We contact Naomi Klein. We give her all the information about Daphne Caruana Galizia, how she was killed in this, in this, in this, with this car bomb, how she was denouncing the corruption in the country, and then she changes the topic of her speech and she speaks to the whole community of authorities and the, the main uh, cultural community in, in Malta about Daphne Caruana Galizia. And, and suddenly they, they find that by another way, Penn has been able to, to give voice. Or Margaret Atwood, who was found in Penn Canada, and, and since then she has been in every campaign we can, we can count on her signing uh, statements and then taking the floor. So Penn is really a community where, where writers are willing to use their celebrity, the, 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 the good part of, being the, of themselves being famous and being able to open doors uh, in defense of the most persecuted and, 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 and most deprived writers in the world. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's also very much an issue, as you say, of sort of trying to balance or aligning that individual agency of the celebrated writer and the collective agency, sort of integrating it, uh, okay. which is, I guess, sometimes sort of a, a very tricky uh, uh, and narrow path to walk. Yeah, perhaps just, um, um, just a point as well, but um, I, I will 
basically repeat uh, what the other speakers have, have said. Um, but from again, from the Indian point of view, since it's the case that I know best, um, uh, in the case of, of the Indian pen, they were the Indian members and founders of the Indian organization were extremely conscious of the fact that having um, celebrities like Tagore, like uh, Gandhi, like Nehru, of course, like Sarojini Naidu, who were all um, um, uh, the leaders also of, of uh, India's freedom struggles and then political leaders was absolutely um, uh, um, crucial in order for, um, you know, these unrecognized other voices uh, to be to be recognized and to be visible, and um, uh, the Indian pen uh, was um, uh, one of the aims of the Indian pen, especially was um, um, to help uh, recognize uh, voices and literatures that were not written in English. Uh, that was really a, a, a huge uh, um, objective of the pen. Is um, uh, for for the world to know of Indian voices and Indian um, uh, writers um, um, that that were yeah unrecognized because they they wrote in in languages that could not be read hence um, um, the 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 very important issue of translation um, which is extremely important for pen today as well I mean Cardas could speak it out about it much better than than I do. Perfect. Well, I mean, now we've done away with the celebrity question. That's sort of you know, the, what I always feel is, 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 is a bit like, as I said before, the elephant in the room. Um, you know, we're always sort of self-conscious about whether we want to call it celebrity or something else or various other forms of cultural capital. Um, I think there are some interesting questions that have absolutely come in now um, in the chat. And I wonder whether actually we want to sort of move on to uh, uh, those questions. Um, so there's one from Michelle, Michelle Kelly, um, who, uh, as of course, we all are absolutely enthralled by uh, your contributions and what you've said. And um, she says, you capture the amazing range of Penn's activities, and especially the sense of Penn as a very broad church, keeping in mind Galsworthy's insistence that the meeting ground is that of letters. What do we have to learn from the way in which writers in particular negotiate their differences? And are there different insights from the archives that you've all been working with to the direct experience of Carlos and, and Margie? I, I can I can ha say one thing uh, just in response to that. I think uh, um, as, as I understood uh, Michelle's question, which is a, it's a great question, uh, what, one of the things I, th I think that's quite interesting looking through the long history of the hundred year history of, of, of Penn's archive and, and one of the things that's extraordinary about this is just simply that we do have a very, very rich and detailed uh, archive of debate around these very, very central issues. So you can, you can uh, the possibilities of a genealogical analysis and a genealogical approach to these fundamental concepts is, is fantastic in this respect. So the one, one thing I think that's interesting in, in response to Michelle and talking about Goldsworthy is that you can, you can there's a really interesting, and I, I think Rachel and, and everybody else will be able to say, try probably have different dates for this, but there's a really interesting tension maybe there from the beginning and all the way through, um, but possibly a, a, a gravitational force shifting in the 1960s, around the 1960s, where Initially, a lot of the discussion around free expression, uh, um, which starts with, you know, championed by Wells in 1933 in response to what's happening in Nazi Germany. But, but what happens is that there's a, there's a discussion about whether this is a special right for writers who constitute a special elite group. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely how lots of people talk. And it's not just fascists like Marinetti who talk like this. So Marinetti will say, you know, pamphleteers do not have this right. Great writers have this right. Uh, they will talk about those sorts of things. So there's often a sense in which that, that's there, that they, what they're defending is a special right for, which is, uh, um, again, understanding as uh, uh, giving a special status to literature as a form of public discourse of a particular kind. But then, then it, there's a shift, and it's, and it's not a straightforward shift because it's going on all the time. But then there's, there's a, a real sense in which they, they're also arguing for a much more basic, fundamental, 
democratic right, uh, which they see as threatened by the state most uh, you know, profoundly, but also by, by non-state actors of various kinds. So this, that's one of the things that I think is quite interesting to track over that long history is the shift from a special status for literary free expression to a more fundamental conception of free expression over, over time. I was just picking up on Michelle's question about um, the relationship between the archive and some of the and, and Margie had been talking. And with regards to Margie's um, discussion of women in pen and women's the rights and the women's manifesto, that incredible document, the, the position of women in pen is, is really uh, an interesting history, I think, because of course the, the organization was set up by a woman um, specifically because there was no club in London that women writers could meet. Um, so it had a feminist impulse right from the start and the initial roster of, of members, a lot of the, the important women writers in London at that time, many of whom were feminists, including Radcliffe ha Hall, uh, May Sinclair and many others. So there was this real feminist focus. Um, but then it is extraordinary also that there has only you know, till, till Jennifer, there was no international pen president who was a woman, although they knew Wolf, by the way, to be international pen president in the 30s. And she said, it's the greatest insult anyone's ever been. She was very insulted by this. Not entirely sure why, but um, so they did try to be the um, pen president, but there were always very, there was always a strong female um, presence in terms of um, uh, pen centers around the world mm -hmm. and women have always been really really active in the organization um, and the women's rights has also was very um, important for the founder of pen too can i just can, are you are you done rachel you've picked your pictures yes yes i'm done, done. um yeah i mean women i think that the 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 thing that the Women's Manifesto makes evident is that power is embodied. You know, the no notion of a neutral body, a neutral kind of citizen is, you know, we don't need to go into all the, the sort of white man syndrome of that now. My experience in literature from the 80s and then particularly the early 90s has been in Namibia and then in South Africa where the whole idea of men of letters um, is not particularly useful because you're dealing with with writers and, and with literary activists who have a very, very different commercial and financial relationship with the publishing industry. You know, you know, we talk about pen about writers, but if you're looking at what is happening in what used to be called the first world, uh, the UK or, or the US or most of Europe, writers have a different um, relationship with publishing. The writers I worked with in Namibia in the early 90s, just after independence, we would, I worked with the first publishing house that was established there, which was producing literature. So it's a much more, not ephemeral, but a, a, a more tenuous. I'm sure Letitia's work with Indian pen would bear this up. There's a whole colonial and post-colonial relationship with um, writing. So one of the first decisions um, I made with my board when I was president of South African Pen is to drop the criteria that you had to have published two books of literary esteem because many amazing writers, particularly people who are writing in, in African languages, did not have that. So it's, a, um, in my view, it's a snobbishness, but it's an exclusion that goes along fault lines of gender, of race, of the history that we're dealing with. So yes, men of letters, um, they talk a bit much at cocktail parties and we need to have them and they're really lovely, some of them and a few of them have even written some great books. But for me in the working of pen on the ground and how it actually works, if you're working as a, a free speech activist and a literary activist, you need to conceptualize it in a different way. If you come from Southern Africa where orature is such a tremendously powerful force uh, literary force, you need to draw in. And we got a number of, of great oral poets and praise singers in Bongis who became members. So that what literature is, is much more interesting if you start looking at it from other parts of the world, 
outside London or outside New York, which are great of great value. But what the so-called periphery can actually bring and enliven and infuse something um, within the sort of world of letters as it is here, which is why I loved Carlos's picture of Ngugi, for instance. You know, a man who brought the otherness, which is not other to him, of course, into this world, a, a, a whole oral tradition, which has then recently become written in Gukuyu and things like that. So they're such exciting ways to think outside of what's clamped in between two covers of a book and who gets to write an op-ed somewhere, which is very enlivening. And of course it works with the internet so well. You know, they're people who only publish now virtually. Um, so, you know, there's very interesting ways of thinking about what that power brings in terms of activism and literature. Does anyone else want to add to this, Carlos or Leticia? Uh, the, 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 to answer a little bit the question of, of Michelle, so how uh, the, the research by Rachel, Peter and Leticia is uh, giving us insights. Of, to me, what has been extraordinary in reading the research is to see how PEN is an organization in permanent research. So how our charter has been changing in the different congresses. And of course, with a, very, a lot of internal uh, debate. And I think that this permanent research, which is updated in each congress and in each meeting for writers in prison or for translation on linguistic rights or for peace or, or for, for the rights of women writers. So it, this permanent research is what has given through the years, of course, it was transformed by the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights in, in 48, but it gave the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights promoted by Penn in 1906 with the immediate support of Ngugi, who participated in debates and the Dalai Lama and so and a crowd of organizations and persons around the world, but also the Women Manifesto, the, the Quebec Declaration on, uh, on Translation, and, and, and on literary translation and translators. So PEN is an organization which is in research and is updating continuously the meaning of our mission in today's world. And today in front of the, of the huge challenges of authoritarianisms and the, the preparation of freedom of expression growing in all the corners of, of the world, we face the centenary next year by updating our mission and really looking forward in the next 100 years how uh, Penn is going to continue being relevant in redefining our mission in today's world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, just to uh, add, uh, sorry. Sorry, uh, Sandra. Well, <laughs> uh, no, just to add to what has been said, um, I think we were interested from the beginning in, in this project more, um, you know, in, in, we were more interested into um, looking at the dissensus mm -hmm. than at, uh, you know, the consensus. So what was really interesting for us is seeing how these debates on freedom, on even the notion of politics, was um, uh, not only debated, but uh, translated, interpreted differently in different contexts. And that's why indeed uh, working both, um, I mean, at the same time on the English pen and on the South African pen and on the Indian pen was really fascinating because in different contexts, these questions are posed differently. Um, and what Carlos just said about an organization that is constantly um, asking questions about itself. I mean, we saw it in the documents um, that we were looking at, um, uh, the, the discussions, the debates, um, uh, the ways, for example, in the Indian pen, just to conclude, but in the Indian pen, which is a newsletter that was st started publishing in 1934 until the 80s, um, you've got all the echoes of, you know, world struggles, world literary news, and at the same time, all the echoes of um, uh, Indian news, Indian struggles, and how all this, you know, um, worked together or did not work together, but was debated together, uh, was really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Margie. Right. We can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. Ah. I just muted myself because my knitting needles are clicking. Um, no, to, in response to what Leticia was saying about the questioning and what's going on in, in South African pen, um, 
under apartheid, it was a very reactionary organization, in my view. I mean, Nadine Gordimer didn't want part of it. She set up amongst, Peter knows more of the detail of this than me, there was a thing called the Congress of South African Writers. You know, when I was a student, you didn't even talk about writers, you talked about cultural workers and things like that. So um, there was, and I suppose in a way, J.M. could see it with his more sort of abstract kind of way of, of dealing with politics and Gordimer, uh, with amongst white writers represented this difference of opinion. But there was, in my view, this unsustainable idea that in a highly politicized fascist country that you writers could somehow step outside daintily outside politics, sort of a bit like Queen Elizabeth when Walter Raleigh puts his coat down so she can step over the puddle there. It was, in my view, that was the approach. Um, it was not it was not morally sustainable, really, but it was a very interesting thing. And it brings uh, this kind of fault line that runs through Penn's history and what I know of it and through the present, this idea that literature can be separate. In my mm -hmm. work on the Women's Manifesto, a woman speaking in public is always political. Until very recently, if you were a person of color speaking in public, your body is visible. So therefore what you say is in relation to this body, which is not the one that's the norm, the citizen, the man. So, it's a conceptualization of politics, of the somatic politics. So the politics of black consciousness and feminism, which said the personal is political, have kind of, I think, kind of brought to an end this notion that you can have an apolitical writer who will dispense on high, you know, words of wisdom and celebrity, et cetera, et cetera. It's morally indefensible and politically impossible. Um, but that's the thing that I think that goes right the way through how people organize. That said, there's very interesting, Carlos will know much more of this than me. Um, in the um, Eastern Bloc, in the Soviet Union, there was a very interesting uh, part of Penn called Writers for Peace, in which because of the Soviet, the Cold War politics, um, you'd have writers who would join together because it was so repressive, there was nothing else. So sometimes there's a way in which you can strategically be seemingly apolitical in very uh, repressive countries, which is, for me, a more interesting politics. I have no patience with writers in a free country who say we're not political. They are, you are, it's, it's how it is. But strategically, you can at times use your capacity and your public voice in a seemingly apolitical way to speak for people. And that to me is a more, I would like to know from the researchers where you found that in, in repressive countries, how that's apparent apolitical thing has been used. I know we used it in Zimbabwe to keep their members, etc. I think, Margaret, this actually ties in with a, a great question that has come in from Asha, Asha Rogers, who sort of picks up on uh, um, a line in the exchange between uh, Peter's email interview with Anki Kropp, where she says that any issue is more than often better served by writers writing than by writers talking and making statements. And so um, her question is how the panelists from your different perspectives and uh, from your experiences with Penn, and I think, Margie, you've also sort, sort of already come to this now in your statement, but also as readers, how you feel about this statement and whether this is still a viable distinction that you, that you can make. So perhaps some of the others would like to come in here and offer your perspectives. So the researchers as, as well, perhaps. Sorry, could you just repeat what the actual question is? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah. So um, she picks up uh, uh, on a line in the email interview between Peter and Anki Croft, where she writes at some point that any issue is more often better served by writers writing than by writers talking and making statements. And Asha wonders whether you can still sort of make that distinction yeah? or whether obviously in, in those troubled and difficult times in which we live, the lines have become more blurred. Carlos, you'd like to yes. add uh, if, to that. If, uh, if Jenny can, can show 
my, my, my last slide with Anna Polikovska and Svetlana Eksevich yeah. because it's, I think it's a very good answer because I would answer that it's both. Mm. So uh, the first picture, uh, Anna Politkovskaya, Pen International Congress, London, uh, 20, uh, 2001, and she is preparing her statement. And of course, what remains of Anna Politkovskaya is her incredible uh, amount of in investigative journalism uh, uh, and how she has revealed the darkest uh, uh, sides of Putin's regime the massive crimes of the genocide, according to her words, in Chechnya. And, uh, and, it, and so both, Anna Polkovskaya was doing both. Things. She was writing a, 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 a work which is of uh, immense and universal value, and she was coming to our congresses to prepare statements and participate uh, in, in, in our activities. And then the other picture is Svetlana Alexievich, uh, whose works has really uh, enlightened us in so many areas, in the women, Russian women participating in the, in, as, as soldiers in the Second World War, or the, 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 the catastrophe of uh, Chernobyl, or uh, the, 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 the corpses of the, of the soldiers coming back from the war in, in Afghanistan. Uh, so, Zdena Alexievich, who has built this incredible uh, who has served uh, the, 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 the values of pen with her, her writing, she finds herself now, today, in the same position of so many dissidents, from Baklav Havel, Anna Polikovskaya, now it's, it's, it's the turn of Svetlana Alexievich, and she's not attacked by, uh, 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 by, by the regime in, in Belarus uh, because of her public statements these days, but it's mainly because she has this body of work and she has decided to be on the side of her people. And the picture of all, uh, this, the, the tweet is from Anne Linde, the Swedish uh, foreign affairs uh, uh, minister, and she's showing all those diplomats supporting uh, and protecting uh, Svetlana Alexievich. So we see that the writer uh, has still, in the world of today, we still have this role of writing and enlightening, uh, showing, revealing the reality and becoming at the same time witnesses of the need of supporting uh, freedom and supporting uh, uh, democracy. And uh, I remember that uh, Heinrich Ball was very provo provocative. He was starting often, his, he was the president of Penn International in the early 70s, and he was often starting his uh, speeches by saying, literature does not need freedom because literature is freedom. So I think that both things are important. As writers, we need to defend freedom, we need to defend our colleagues who are, who are experiencing repression, and we need to develop our body of work, which is freedom in itself for any reader who wants to open the pages. Let me just sort of, you know, put together uh, perhaps sort of two questions, because I think they're very much about sort of looking ahead and the, the future of pen. So again, a question that came up here in the chat is, uh, quite an interesting one, uh, you know, sort of asking you all to be uh, kind of soothsayers a little bit. So from your immersion in the past 100 years, have you had any insights on the next 100 years? I think that's quite interesting, especially in the age of global social media, blogging and the age of COVID and I suppose the challenges that has posed. And um, also a question that's about sort of looking ahead and um, the, the future of pain. So there's a, uh, a wonderful question from Daniel Gorman in uh, the Zoom Q&A function. So thank you all for the excellent presentations and discussion. Truly fascinating with current context and threats to democracies, given how the term free speech is being used to various ends in the current context. And looking into the history of Penn, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on if or how Penn should be selective in the writers that it champions. How it should respond to Karl Popper's provocation that in order to maintain a tolerant society, the society must be intolerant of intolerance. Does anyone have any thoughts on that, Margie? Um, thanks, Daniel. That's such a great question. Um, for, for me, how I've understood Penn in my personal experience and then watching, you know, my own limited work with it and then watching other, um, you know, the activism over the last 10 years. One of the things that 
the way in which we can think of, of, of what pain can do. And this is looking into the future. So if you, I don't know as much in the detail of the history, but it was very much to do with writers who were at risk and um, free speech threats and how to deal with that. We've had um, a rapid kind of change over in how information works and how speech is circulated, all sorts of things that we are all familiar with. But looking into how I imagine the future, one of the things that I think Penn has done very, very effectively with the, with the idea of free speech, and perhaps this is because of writers, is that for me, the balance side of free speech, the right to free speech is the obligation to listen. Mm. Um, the, the quickest way of looking at what the alt-right, what the, far, the sort of weaponizing of, of free speech that's happened in sections of the American media, and it's, it's infecting, the sort of contagion is affecting here, is that free speech has come to be understood at the right to kind of bellow in everybody's ear anything you wish. That is a false understanding, I think, of how free speech works. It is a reciprocal thing. So there's a way in which Penn does, through, through use of writers, understand this kind of Mobius strip between listening and speaking, listening and speaking, and finding a common way. Perhaps it was that image I was trying to use with Telemachus and Penelope and the, the wise men. So I think that what Penn really, one of its strongest things is to provide a non-partisan political space in which the foundational thing of human society, which is speech and listening, speech and listening, can take place. And much of what Penn's activities is providing that space. So to, to look at Karl Popper's thing, do we need to tolerate intolerance to have a tolerant society? Yes, I would agree with that, absolutely. My caveat is that those who are intolerant, of, way must be found in which they also have to be quiet and to listen. Um, there are very few people who can sustain constant bellowing if they need to do that. So it's a way, I think what my imagination of it for the future is a way of re-suturing these broken human connections. Mendacious publishing, all of that is going to do, but if we think of it as a, as a, a, a connectivity, I'm a writer, Carlos, we're all writers, we write to connect, people read to hear, etc. So that is a very important aspect of the, the texture of the politics that we can do. So this nonpartisan political space in which people speak freely and then listen. Mm. I mean, if, we, if we all get a, have a quick uh, speculation uh, uh, at, the, at the end uh, to, to round off, I mean, I'd the, 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 just say two things very quickly, briefly. One is um, that I, my own guess is that we're going to see a tr ongoing transformation of all these debates uh, because of the rise, uh, partly technologically enabled rise, but not only that, of non-state actors. So uh, the future will be uh, a world in which whether we talk about censorship or whether we talk about various kinds of social conformity or groupthink and the power that social media have to impose that uh, sometimes with violent consequences or at least violent intent. I suspect that's going to be a, a, key, a key dynamic in the future. Um, looking back to the past, uh, for the future, I think one of the key lessons I get personally from the Penn archive, both in terms of pragmatic decisions and the principled articulations of its views collectively formulated in things like the Charter, is that in fact, whenever we're talking about free freedom of expression, certainly within the history, the history of Penn just says this loudly and clearly all the time. You're never talking about freedom of expression only. You're actually mm. talking about a constant set of balancing acts where there's mendacious publication, fake news, hate speech. There's responsibilities to keep that down as much as there's responsibilities to build things up. So that it's, there's no straightforward, clear, uh, answer outside of the world of lived experience uh, that can be articulated and the pen archive just tells you that all the time from the 1920s to the present. There is no such clear cut principled world in which free speech is one straightforward good. It's always complex. 
Does anyone else want to offer any concluding thoughts on what the future of PEN and the issues it promotes is going to look like or should look like? My, my belief is that uh, one of the key elements for the next 100 years is this fact. I mean, one thought I have. Right. Do, go ahead, Carlos. <laughs> okay. So uh, it is that that uh, is the different world map that Penn represents. Uh, the fact that Penn welcomes all voices. This principle of, of hospitality from the very beginning makes that today in Penn we have Tibetan writers abroad, we have Uyghur writers abroad, we have the Kurdish Penn Center, we have the Maya writing community, the Quechua writing community, we have the Eritrean, the North Korean, the Cuban in exile. We, we have Iranian in exile. We have, so we represent another understanding of internationality. And this is what I think is going to be a key element. And all those voices are going to make our mission very much relevant uh, in every decade in the coming years. I think this is an absolutely wonderful and very hopeful note on, on which to end. Uh, it's definitely a shame that we won't be able to continue this discussion and celebrate the work of Penn and all of you over a glass of wine, as we had originally planned, of course, but I do hope that all of you, perhaps with the exception of Leticia, for whom it's, I think, still a bit early in the day, that you find some nice and pleasant ways of ending this Friday evening. So a huge thank you once more to Peter, Leticia, Rachel, Carlos and Margie for being with us here today and for highlighting the ways in which writers and the collectives they've formed have been at the forefront and continue to be at the forefront of this struggle for human rights and free expression. So it's definitely been a great privilege for Art in Action to host this event. And uh, we'll definitely be looking out for the exciting program of events surrounding the Penn Centenary celebrations next year, as well as the events organized by the Writers and Free Expression Project, uh, which I think has probably suffered a similar fate as Art in Action with some of the conferences planned in India and in South Africa for this year and next delayed due to uh, the ongoing uh, public health crisis. So I do hope that there will be um, a new format or uh, a new way of, of, of recreating these events and, or, or finally making them happen. Um, so a big thank you to all of you. And uh, I'd like to thank specifically Peter for bringing together this wonderful panel and also on a personal note for his longstanding and continuous support of this Art in Action project. Um, I mean, Art in Action is really the fruit of a collaborative effort of so many dedicated individuals without whom we wouldn't have been able to pull this off. And speaking of collaborative efforts, uh, you've seen the wonderful slides that were uh, produced and uh, what you've not seen is the kind of stuff that's been going on behind the scenes. So a huge thank you to our colleague Jenny, Jenny Toya for her support behind the scenes and of course our project partners Torch, the FAF Austrian Science Fund, Oxford Centre for Life Writing, Postcolonial Writers Make Worlds and Stephen Spender Trust. Now, as I said at the beginning, Art in Action is nearing its grand finale. So join us again next week on Friday, the 25th of September, for a fascinating panel on authorship and authority, um, which I think ties straight in with the issues that uh, we've been touching upon here today, with case studies focusing on Knut Hamsun, Constantine Cavafi and Pier Paolo Pasolini. So don't miss this last event in our series and all the details can be found online. And even better, click on the link that's I think just coming through the chat here if uh, you want to join us for that event. So once more, thank you all for joining us and stay well and stay safe most importantly these days and uh, good evening from Vienna. See you very soon. <laughs>